Welcome to another installment of Friday q and I hope you've all had a fantastic week. As always, to everybody who submitted a question for this week's video, thank you very much. If you've got a question you would like me to answer on next week's Q&A, put it in the comment section below. There's links to support the channel and get yourself some free stuff in the video description. Let's go. Let's start out with some basic geography. If you're in the United States, is it yesterday for me or is it tomorrow for me? I'm actually speaking to you from the future. Western Australia is about 12 hours ahead of Eastern time in the United States. So I'm definitely in the future. The toilet water flushes in the opposite direction and we have these things called drop bears. Read about them. Have I checked out the Boogie Badlander? And if I have, would I recommend it over something like a dual rectifier? I'm guessing you mean like an older dual rectifier in a dual amp setup for quad tracking rhythms. I still haven't tried one. I would love to because all the clips I've heard of the Badlander, it just kind of sounds like a boosted recto. And I've recorded a lot with a boosted Revision G rectifier. If you've listened to our album Back to Zero, that's a boosted Revision G dual rectifier paired up with another amp, either a Splorn Nitro, a Marshall DSL. I think we use a 5150 or an ADA MP1 on one track. Bunch of different amps in there, but the boogie was kind of the main DNA there. And I think it is such a fantastic formula for getting those huge crushing rhythm guitar tones. My thoughts on the Moore Ocean Machine, the Devon Townsend signature ambient in a box pedal. I still haven't tried one, but I know a few people on my Discord server have, and they really, really enjoy it. I feel like I saw a Plague Scythe Studios video with the Ocean Machine where it sounded pretty amazing. It seems like a great way to have a single unit that can perform a whole bunch of different functions. That is one of the amazing things about digital gear is you can have something with a really small footprint that can be incredibly versatile. And I absolutely love Devon's clean tones and everything I've heard from that box sounds like it matches up pretty well with what they're doing. How do I run my fractal gear live? And what would I recommend if you wanna use a real guitar cabinet? I've been going straight to the PA for over five years now. I did start out by doing a few gigs running an XFX Ultra into a power amp and a cabinet. And then very quickly, I just got super lazy and only started taking the XFX. We actually use in-ears now, so no cabs on stage. And that is a really easy, really clean setup. Having said that, I would say if you like the sound and you enjoy the experience of playing through a real guitar amp with a guitar cabinet, that's something that's really, really fun. It's fun to move air. Feeling that reinforcement behind you on stage is something that a lot of people are just really comfortable with. And I kind of miss that sometimes. I really, really spent so much time playing with amps and cabinets on stage that every now and then, it's nice to feel the air move. So I would say something like a Matrix Power Amp and you can do something like on an Axe FX3 or an FM9 with dual amps, actually run independent amps to your cab. So you keep yourself happy, you have your big thumpy guitar sound on stage, and then you send a signal to front of house that is idealized to sit in the mix. So like I was saying earlier, maybe you have more of like a scoop tone for you on stage and more of a mid focus tone to your front of house mix. And that seems like a fantastic best of both worlds solution. This is pretty interesting, this one. What's my opinion of guitar players who have amazing chops playing with bands that maybe aren't guitar oriented bands? For example, if you look at Nuno Betancourt playing with Rihanna, or you look at somebody like Brett Garced playing with Nelson back in the day, there's a bunch of other examples of players with incredible chops playing in bands that, you know, maybe just pop bands or they're more focused on a non-rock guitar style. I think it's awesome because at the end of the day, somebody like Nuno is not just a guitar player, they're an amazing all around musician. And something that Nuno is gonna bring to an act like that is professionalism as well. You know, they have been to the highest of highs in the music industry, so they're not gonna be overwhelmed by anything. And you know, Nuno might get their two minute solo spot at an arena show and then have the professionalism and the ability to kind of put their ego aside and just sit back and have fun. And 
playing in a band like that would be amazing. That's like a dream of mine, sitting in with a band where all the musicians would be monsters, but the focus of the show isn't only the music. The music is one important aspect of this entire show that's going out to people. It's something that's larger than life. And, you know, there's a reason why people like Nuno or Brett Garcet do this aside from the fact that they'd be getting paid very well. It would be a real unique experience for them to kind of exercise the spectrum of their skills rather than just shredding, even though shredding is very important. Have I tried a PRS SE Silver Sky yet? And what are my thoughts on the SE line in general? If you've been keeping up with the channel, you would have seen my SE Custom 2408 and my SE Mark Holcomb seven string videos. The Holcomb in particular really, really blew me away. I love that guitar. The 2408 is a fantastic instrument as well, but I'm yet to try a Silver Sky. John Cordy has a few really interesting videos with the PRS Silver Sky that I would recommend checking out, uh, not just for the Silver Sky, mostly for John Cordy, because they're an amazing guitar player and John's videos have such a great balance between the stylistic playing stuff and the balanced opinions. Fantastic channel. Go and subscribe if you haven't already. I would really like to try one of the PRS SE hollow bodies with a piezo. I feel like that would be really great for some of the acoustic gigs that I do. And if you saw the ragdoll vlog where we're doing acoustic, where I was actually using a piezo pickup on my JP7, uh, something like a hollow body would feel maybe a little bit more in that direction. So I'd be really keen to try that, but overall, very impressed. Seymour Duncan pickups, would I go with a JB or a custom five if I had to choose just one pickup? I have two core PRS custom 24s. One has a JB in the bridge, one has a custom five in the bridge. I think the JB is just such a great all around rock pickup you don't have to think too hard about it when you have a JB. It might not be perfect for everything, but it does just work a lot of the time. So that green PRS that you see a lot on the channel has the JB Jazz set. The Jazz is probably my favorite neck humbucker ever. The Custom 5 that I've got in my blue Custom 24 though, that to me has a little bit more of a unique character. It works really well for ragdoll stuff. I took that guitar with me when we toured Europe a few years ago and it sounded insane every night, straight into the Axe FX, straight into the PA, such a smooth player, insanely low action, and that pickup really brought that guitar to life. So I would say for just an all round rock pig, a JB, for something with maybe a bit of a unique voice, a custom five. Why don't I own any guitars with an Evertune bridge? I only got introduced to the whole experience of really playing an Evertune at the Western Australian Guitar Festival last year around October. and. I was really, really impressed. In fact, I was talking about the PRS SE stuff earlier. I saw you can get the Mark Holcomb SE with an Evertune and something like that is on the list for me. I feel like in a studio setting where you need to track down tuned rhythms and have them like perfectly intoned, that that would just save so much time. And, you know, it's kind of one of the truly original and unique ideas that's come along with guitar hardware since a guitar has come along, you know, you've got the like Fender style tremolo bridge and you've got the Floyd Rose and you've got the Evertune and maybe the Carla and maybe like locking tuners or something like that. There's probably a bunch more that you could all list in the comments, but I'm definitely going to get one at some point and hopefully uh, fill that little gap in the collection. This one goes out to a friend of the channel, Tim. They asked about this green guitar in particular, the inlays. My dad made this guitar. I'll get the inlays up nice and close. So it's like a, you know, Ibanez gem style, come on, you can focus. Don't focus on my dumb face. There we go. Uh, this is all hand cut Western Australian pearl from Broom. I remember as a kid, my dad grinding down these huge pearl shells and uh, yeah, hand cutting all of these inlays. It's on ebony, so it just looks absolutely stunning. And the actual nut on this guitar, which you can probably see right here, the autofocus is having a hard time today. It doesn't like my face. I've got a duck. There we go. The nut on this is pearl as well. And uh, you wouldn't think that that would work too great, but it actually works pretty well. One last one, the semiconductor shortage and its impact on not just the availability of guitar gadgets, but on their quality. I think you're gonna see manufacturers really try to diversify when it comes to the parts that they need and where they source parts from, whether that will impact quality kind of remains to be seen. I think 
a lot of the time when it comes to guitar gear in particular, if there's one component different, even though it may be an equivalent component, you know, guitar players will claim that they can hear or see a difference. But I think for the majority of manufacturers, for example, if you look at stuff like the Fractal stuff, you know, they haven't compromised and gone and just churned out lesser quality units. There's just a long waiting list for their gear. So it's not just that we're waiting. It's like everybody across the industry and kind of the world in general is waiting for stuff. So I would be very skeptical of claims that might come up over the next couple of years where it might be, say, like a company like Boss and people like, oh, you know, Boss went and sourced this particular component from some other factory in some other company and now it doesn't sound as good. A lot of the time with this gear, it's about the design rather than the component. And so much guitar gear out there, especially the pro quality stuff, whether it's a Fractal stuff or the Line 6 stuff or any other manufacturer you want to talk about, they're probably over-engineered. Thanks so much for watching this week's Q&A. Again, if you have questions for next week, put them in the comment section below. We do have some ragdoll shows to announce very, very soon for people on the East Coast. There's only going to be a couple of shows, but they will be coming over the next couple of months. I'm super excited to announce those. Hopefully they will get announced at the start of next week and I can talk about them next week. If you want to support what I do on the channel or with the band, there's links in the video description to do all of that. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next time.